Good morning. It's not a great line we were just singing. And when I come to die, give me Jesus. It's not just bless your soul. It really blesses my soul when I hear of believers who have walked with Jesus for so many years, and then they still keep clinging to Jesus, even in their final moments, all the way to the end. Last year, uh, we lost uh, Pastor Tim Keller, a uh, speaker, author. He was 72 years old. After a three-year battle with cancer, he spent his last days with his family. And he said, I'm thankful for all the people who've prayed for me over the years. I'm thankful for my family that loves me. I'm thankful for the time God has given me. But I'm ready to see Jesus. I can't wait to see Jesus send me home. Isn't that great? I was chatting with Wilco this week, uh, who just lost his mom, Carmen, or her. And uh, we were agreeing that, yes, there are uh, plenty of testimonies of young people who have, whatever, been out in the world and, and God has radically transformed their life. And that's great. That's fantastic. Uh, that glorifies God, those kind of testimonies. But you know what's really inspiring to me is those people who have faithfully walked with Jesus 50, 60, 70 years, and, and they're still clinging to him, their last moments. Now, not that they've necessarily followed him perfectly or, or all of these things, but through all the struggles, hardships, and, and temptations that, that they consistently say, I choose Jesus. I love that. So inspiring to see people get to the end and finish well. In the book of 2 Timothy, we read what is most likely Paul's uh, last recorded words. Uh, he's probably sitting in, in a prison somewhere, in about 60, in somewhere in his 60s, uh, and he's waiting for his final trial. And it is very evident that the end is near uh, for Paul. Uh, and so he gets his scribe and he uh, writes one last letter to his protege, Timothy. Uh, Timothy had been one of the guys who was traveling along with Paul through all of his missionary journeys. We find that out in the book of Acts. Uh, and then somewhere along the way, he was left in the, the city of Ephesus to lead the church there. And uh, so here Paul is sitting in prison and writing him this last letter and inviting him, first of all, come, come visit me one last time. Uh, and also, probably more importantly, uh, he's, his final words are really charging Timothy to carry on the work of the gospel, right? So uh, there were all these different people that had been falling away into false teachings and whatnot. And so, he, so he pleads with Timothy and exhorts him, stay true to the word of God. And so here we have two people uh, on either end of the spectrum, right? So here's the older person who's nearing the end of his leg in the journey. And uh, then this younger person who's right at the beginning. And so this whole letter is really like Paul kind of passing the baton onto Timothy. You know, like the relay runners, the one uh, carries the, the baton for his leg of the race and then uh, passes it on to the next guy to carry it for the next leg of the race. And so Paul says, he's like, look, Timothy, look, my time is up, man. Uh, it's time for you to take over, carry the torch, carry the baton. And so then right at the end of this letter, uh, in chapter four, verses six through eight, Paul gives us a few comments about his perspective from somebody who's at the end of his journey. Right. And uh, I think then he shows us what it looks like for somebody to finish well. And, and so I think we can learn a few things from this passage about how we can then run our race so that when we get to the end, we can finish well also. So you can turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, and I encourage you to keep it open there. Uh, throughout, we'll be referring to that, but then I'll put all the cross references on the screen so you don't have to flip around and everything. Okay. So, reading from verse 6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So starting there from verse 6, Paul is describing his, his imminent death. That uh, He says he's like being poured out like a drink offering. 
So if we look back in the Old Testament, the drink offering was usually wine that was poured out over a sacrifice. Okay, and so that reminds us of Romans chapter 12, verse 1, where Paul is encouraging us to to, uh, present our bodies as a living sacrifice to God. Okay, and and Paul himself was a great example of that. Uh, He spent his whole life serving God and following God, and, and he laid down his life on the altar. And he says, for me, to live is Christ. And then, as if to top off that sacrifice, he says, my death will be like the drink offering poured out over that sacrifice, will be emptied out to the very last. Okay, so Paul's life is a worship sacrifice to God, and then his death is going to be the adding uh, on top of that sacrifice. (coughs) Then he uses this other phrase, the time of my departure has come. So that word translated departure comes from the word meaning to loose or to untie or to release. It's also used of untying a boat from the dock, okay? And so Paul, his whole life has been this exciting journey of following Jesus, and now he has one last journey ahead of him, right? To to pull up the anchor from these earthly shores and to, to go through the sea of death and to land on those heavenly shores on the other side. It's almost there. And then in verse seven, he uses three illustrations summarizing his his kind of Christian journey, like three little snapshots of what it looks like to finish well. And so this is where we're going to take most of our time this morning and unpack these these three things one at a time. Okay. So number one, I have fought the good fight. You don't have to read very much uh, from Paul to find out that this idea that the Christian life is a battle. And it's all over his writings, but uh, most of all, it's all over his life. Like his life is a demonstration of, of Christianity as a battle, as a struggle. And I'm pretty sure I don't have to convince you of that. Anybody who's actually tried following Jesus knows it's a struggle. It's a battle. So the obvious question that comes up then is, well, what are we fighting against? Or maybe it'd be easier to ask, what, what aren't we fighting against? Because right? it feels like everywhere we turn, there's, there's some enemy or, or some opposition that's trying to fight against us, trying to pull us away from Jesus. But let's start with perhaps the most familiar one. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13, Paul writes, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, but against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. For the Christian... This is not a a physical fight, right? It's not like we go out and we're like punching out unbelievers and stuff, right? It's not a physical battle. It's a spiritual battle. Satan is the enemy of God. And and, and everywhere that we go, Satan's out there trying to kind of trip us up and make us fall and stumble, right? First Peter describes, uh, describes Satan like a roaring lion looking for his next Christian meal, okay? But, but don't get eaten, fight. We got to fight against it. Okay. I've never, thankfully, actually been in a, had to fight a lion, you know, but, but if I did, I promise you, I'm not going out quietly, right? I'm going to do some damage uh, (laughs) as best I can. Uh, Okay. Also hardships and sufferings and persecution are a struggle. Uh, Back in second Timothy chapter three, verse 12, he says, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Right? And that caused a lot of people to fall away from following after Jesus. When the choice came between Christianity with persecutions or renouncing Christ and, and living the comfortable life, they chose the comfortable life. But what about Paul? Well, he was publicly discredited, threatened, mocked, beaten, stoned, shipwrecked, in prison, even writing this letter, he's sitting in prison. But did that cause him to lose his faith? Did that scare Paul away from following Jesus? No. What did he say? He said, this is just sharing in the sufferings of Christ, right? And it, suffering couldn't defeat Paul, and he said it, it shouldn't defeat Timothy. He tells him, share in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Soldier fights. Got to fight for the faith in the midst of suffering. We also 
struggle against false ideas, the philosophies and thinking patterns of this world try and pull us away from Jesus. Look what he says in in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, that is these physical bodies, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For our weapons, uh, for, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. What are those? Well, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. We take every thought captive to obey Christ. Right? We're battling against false ideas. And, and so this is why Paul, he keeps telling Timothy to rebuke and correct. He says, Cling to sound doctrine in chapter 1 and and to avoid foolish controversies, chapter 2. He says, then to continue in what you've learned in the scriptures in chapter 3. It's a fight. It's a struggle. we got to stand for the truth against false ideas of the world. Let me give a little warning then for particularly those young people, those of you who are going off to university soon. This is going to be a particular battlefield for you. Whether it's university lecturers or peer pressure or those quotes on social media or whatever, the world is trying to convince you to think the way that the world thinks. And now when you're trying to kind of navigate through this newfound independence, right, then, then all these new ideas, they, they sound, sound great, but you got to fight against it. Cling to the word of God. Memorize the word of God. Fill up your head with that so that you can be able to discern the truth from the lies. So be warned, struggle, fight against false ideas. Fighting against our sinful desires is also a struggle. We're trying to to pursue righteousness and and impurity and and Christ-like character, the fruits of the Spirit, but, but then our, our, our sinful desires are trying to pull us away, to pull us in the other direction. And so we got to fight against that. we got to put our sinful desires to death. Let me give another a little side comment here. Maybe there's an area in your life where you're not actually uh, fighting against sin. You're, you're actually freely indulging in sin. Well, then biblically, we're, we're called to, to confront and rebuke and, and correct each other in those kind of things. And, but if someone does that for you, Remember that they are not your enemy, right? They are, are, are actually for you, right? So, so, so don't just, just get all defensive and, or even worse, sometimes we go on the offensive against them. But no, they're for you. They're, they're helping you in the battle against sin. Our struggle is against sin. They're on your team. So as we struggle against sin, let's be humble and, and let us get people on your team. Right? Let people speak into your life. Don't need to get all defensive and, uh, about these kind of things, but, but let them help you to fight the battle against sin. Okay. And then uh, a last area of this battle that I just want to highlight is Paul says that, that gospel work can be a struggle, like right? trying to evangelize and disciple people. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 28 and following, he writes, We proclaim him, that is Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, I struggle, that's the same word there, for fighting, and, and all, uh, with all of his energy that he powerfully works within me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you, the Colossians, and for the Laodiceans, and for all that have not seen me face to face. Discipling people can be a struggle. Right? Anybody who's helped out in Sunday school or helped out at YWAP or tried to share the gospel with somebody, you know that. Right? Helping people to find answers for their doubts and, and for all of their intellectual questions, that can be a, a struggle. Addressing sin issues, like we just mentioned, can be a struggle. Helping somebody to, to get back up after they keep falling into temptation over and over again can be a struggle. Dealing with opposition to the gospel as you're out trying to share the gospel can be a struggle. What Paul says to his disciples, look, I'm fighting for you guys. I'm fighting to present you mature in Christ. But man, all this fighting can get pretty hard. You know, when when we're in a fight, sometimes we get beaten down, get tired, we get worn out. 
right? And I feel like calling it quits. You're knocked down on the mat, right? The referee is over you, counting. One, two, three. Man, how do we get back up? How do we keep fighting when it gets hard? Well, let me highlight one verse now, and then we'll come to one more later. Uh, Look what it says here in Colossians, in verse 29. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. So do you notice the two things that are are working in tension here? This isn't just some kind of, ooh, let go and let God, right? Paul says, I toil. Paul's the one doing the struggling. He's the one doing the fighting. But it's Christ's power that's strengthening him for that fight in order to keep fighting. I think it's a really important tension for us to keep in mind here, okay? That remember that that as you are, are fighting, round after round in this battle against these enemies day after day, that victory in this battle is not dependent on your own strength. Okay, the ultimate victory is grounded in Jesus and and the fact that he actually already won the victory. He has already overpowered Satan, sin, and death. Right, so now they are defeated enemies, although they're still very present Right, we, we feel their presence. Uh, and so as we continue fighting against them with faith in Jesus and, and in the victory that he's already won. Okay, so for example, we fight against sin because we believe, we have faith that in Christ there's forgiveness for sins and that there's freedom from slavery to sin. And so I can choose obedience. And, and when I fall, I, I confess and I repent and I get back up and I keep fighting. We argue against false ideas because we believe, we have faith that God's word is truth and that it's powerful. We have joy in suffering because we believe that suffering doesn't have the final say, that we're still looking forward to our real home. Okay, so our day-to-day battles, they're fought by faith, believing in Christ's victory. And and so they're fought in, in hope because we know that he's already won the victory. So it's not dependent on our strength just to to keep fighting. You don't have to feel like you have to do all the work, okay? So that's the encouragement, that no matter how hard it gets, keep fighting, don't give up. Get back up in the ring, go another round. Strengthened by Christ's energy that powerfully works within you. So when you get to the end, you too can say, I've fought the good fight. Number two, Paul says, I have finished the race. Athletics is a pretty fitting illustration for the Christian life, I think, uh, because both of these involve a a lot of uh, self-discipline and sacrifice. All those who are involved in athletics or, or sports know this. Athletes put themselves through intense physical training to to build up their bodies and and conditioning and and all of this to to strengthen their bodies for what they need to do. They practice regularly to improve the skills that they need and and also that they can win that ultimate prize. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, Paul writes, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things, They do it to receive a perishable wreath. Okay, you know, like the little leafy crown thing they used to win in the Olympics uh, way back in the day. But we, an imperishable one. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body. I keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. On this point, I love uh, the example of one of my favorite athletes, Tom Brady. Widely considered one of the greatest ever to to play his position. Uh, He won seven championships, which is a lot, okay? Uh, And (laughs) so he played professionally until he was 45 years old, like professional athlete at 45 years old, okay? How did he do all this? How did he accomplish all this? Well, he and his personal trainer developed a daily schedule uh, for both in-season and out-of-season, which was micromanaged down to the minute. They scheduled his workouts, his meals, his treatments, his recovery, his practice, even his sleep. And they mapped out the schedule for the next three years. 
at a time. Okay. Now he was already the best, but he hired a, a private coach to refine what they say was like the top 2% of his skills that actually still needed improvement. He regulated his diet, uh, eating things like hummus and raw snack bars and avocado ice cream. He would not have made a very good Namibian. Uh, <laughs> at one breakfast, he even uh, was caught kind of picking sausages out of his omelet. Okay. They even developed for him a brain resiliency program. Okay, they did some neurological tests and developed a program that, so that he could work out his brain in the same way that he worked out his body. Uh, so these exercises helped him to process information more quickly, to assist with his memory, to increase his per peripheral vision of the sides and to increase how far he could see. And then I love this quote that he said at his retirement. To be successful at anything, the truth is you don't have to be special. You just have to be what most people aren't, consistent, determined, and willing to work for it. That was his mindset. He literally shaped his entire life around being the best player that he could be. And all of that for what? A couple championship rings, worldly fame, millions of dollars. None of that lasts. That's the perishable wreath. Is that the prize that you're striving for? I always say, if, if Tom Brady was willing to put that much commitment and self-discipline into something as temporary and meaningless as sports, then how much more should I be willing to put that commitment and self-discipline into the one thing that really does matter, my own spiritual life and, and serving God? So don't run this race aimlessly like, like you don't know where you're going. Don't just box like you're flailing your arms around in the air, right? Be self-disciplined in your Christian life. Bring your body, your, your sinful desires under the control of Christ. Pursue him first and foremost like you're actually trying to win the prize. Paul uses this illustration again in Philippians chapter 3, uh, verses 12 to 14. Not that I have already obtained this or have already or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul's looking, he's looking forward. He's not looking back. Right, that former life that I used to have, all the, the sin that I used to be involved in, or, or maybe all those, those useless works of self-righteousness, right? Forget that. That's behind me. I'm straining forward. I'm striving forward, pressing on. Like you feel the intensity of those words that he's using here. The runner, you don't look around at the competition, right? That's how you lose, right? You, you look back at them and then they overtake you and then they win. Look forward. Look to the finish line so that you can win the prize. And the real prize is that I belong to God in Christ Jesus. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, right, like all the, all the fans in the stadium, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder, perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary, faint-hearted. This Christian life, it's like, it's like a marathon, long-distance race, right? We have a bunch of those runners here. I know. Uh, so, you guys, when you're getting ready for your race, do you, you know, throw on a backpack, take some stuff along for the ride, for the, for the long journey, like maybe a, some food, some water you throw in there, an extra pair of shoes in case you get some holes in it, you know, maybe your iPad, catch up on your series while you're running along, and maybe a camp stove, you want to stop for a hot meal along the way, you fill up a backpack and take that along your race with you? No! You want to get rid of all that stuff, you want to be as light as possible. You don't want to carry a whole bunch of baggage around with you. It's the same for us in our Christian journey. As you're running this, this Christian race, throw off the baggage. 
Don't carry around so much useless weight. Throw off, it says, first of all, those sins which weigh us down, by all means, get rid of that. But then maybe there's also some other things, some weights, things uh, maybe like, like God's good gifts that he actually gives to us. But when you, when you place those things in the place of God, then they become weights that pull you down, distractions from the race. And then notice that it also says, run with endurance. Ooh, when you hear that word endure, <laughs> you know, it brings a little tear to the eye, right? You know, because that means something hard's coming. You don't, en- you don't endure things that you love, right? You endure th- things that you don't like very much. For me, in basketball practice, that was the word baseline. Because you know that meant that we were about to do sprints. But you know that the coach is making you do those sprints th- to build up your stamina, right? To give you an edge on the competition. So at the end of the game, when they are worn out, you can keep going, Right? So you endure the pain of those sprints because you know that that's what it takes to win the prize. The the prize is worth the pain. Look there in verse 2. Jesus is our example of this. He endured his own people hanging him on the cross. The shame of our sin upon him, his father turning his face away. How could he endure all of that? Because of the joy that's set before him. The joy of of pleasing the Father. The joy of of demonstrating God is victorious. The joy of, of redeeming and saving his friends. He knew that the prize was worth the pain. And so if you get weary and faint hearted, look to Jesus, follow his example of endurance. And also Paul's too. In the book of Acts, Paul is uh, traveling on his way back to Jerusalem. And as, he, as he's going there, he keeps being told that when he gets there, he's going to be arrested and imprisoned. And so then when he's saying goodbye to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, he says, And now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that, uh, that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not count my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course. That's the same phrase that's used back in 2 Timothy. That I may finish the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. This is such a bold statement, I love it. I don't count my life as any value or precious to myself. Now, now he's not devaluing the human life. That's not the point. But Paul says he doesn't cling to life, to his his own life. He realizes that he lives in a context where preaching the gospel may cost him his life. Right? There was actually one city where he was preaching the gospel and and so they dragged him out of the city and they stoned him. They literally stopped stopped stoning him because they thought he was dead. And so what does he do? He backs up and keeps preaching the gospel. (laughs) For Paul, he knew that the cause was more important than the cost. He was willing to endure the suffering and the persecution because he knew that that's what it would take in order for more and more people to come to know Jesus. And if that ended up taking, meaning that, that he would lose his life, they would take his life, then you know what? Death is gain because I get to go be with Jesus, and that's far better. So now here he is at the end of his life, and he can say, I made it. I finished the race, the finish line. It's it's right there. I can see it because because I threw off all of those weights that were weighing me down. I disciplined my body. I mastered my fleshly desires. But notice again, it's not about perfection. It says, not that I have attained all this, but he strained And he strived, he was pressing forward, not looking back, not looking around at the competition. He's looking at Jesus standing there at the finish line. He made it to the end. He finished the race. And then number three, he says, I have kept the faith. The faith being his faith in Jesus. 
One of the major themes that we see running throughout this whole letter of 2 Timothy is Paul warning Timothy about people who've fallen away from the faith. So if you have your Bible open, looking down there in verse 10, he talks about Demas. And he says he was too in love with the world. And so he walked away from the faith. Or Phagellus and Hermogenes and all the Asians in chapter 1, verse 15, deserted Paul. Or like Hymenaeus and Philetus, who swerved from the truth in chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. Or like the godless people that are described in chapter 3. Or in, in chapter 4, those who have itching ears and they, they just want teachings that suit their own passions. They're all falling away from the faith. Sadly, we hear about this a lot in our own day, don't, don't we? In the last couple of years, whether they call it deconstructionism or a mid-faith crisis, we've heard of so many pro, high-profile evangelical Christians, leaders, who have turned their back on Jesus and renounced the faith. Joshua Harris, popular author, former pastor of a megachurch, said, I've undergone a massive shift in regard to my faith in Jesus. By all measurements I have for defining a Christian, I am not a Christian. Hillsong songwriter Marty Sampson, I'm genuinely losing my faith and it doesn't bother me. It's not for me. I am not in anymore. David Gass, former pastor of three different large churches, after 40 years of being a devout follower, 20 of those being an evangelical pastor, I am walking away from the faith. Paul Maxwell, former author for Desiring God Ministries, I think it's important to say I'm just not a Christian anymore. Derek Webb, Michael Gunger, Brady, Fanatic, Goodwin, the list goes on and on. Maybe these are not names of people that you know or are familiar with, but I'm sure you have your own list of people that you know who've turned their backs on Jesus and walked away from the faith. So, so Timothy is warned against these people, right? Paul says, beware, guard yourself, avoid, gently correct them. But then he's also warned not to join them. Timothy, don't you fall away too. Paul tells him, Guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Keep to the sound doctrine. Continue in the scriptures. Share in and, and endure suffering for the sake of the gospel. Don't you fall away from the faith too. And let me warn us, New Song Family Church, that is a danger and a risk for every one of us. I don't care how Calvinist your theology is, okay? Not one of us is above the temptation, the possibility of falling away. That's what Peter thought. Hours before he denied Jesus three times, right? Pride comes before the fall. Don't think that you are above that temptation. Right? Why else would we have so many exhortations in the New Testament not to fall away? Not even, not even the Apostle Paul thought himself above that temptation. We just read in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 there, but I discipline my body, I keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Now again, uh, let's be theologically accurate here. We need to hold these two things in tension. On the one hand, it's only by the grace of God that we are saved. It's not dependent on our works, right? And uh, it's he who began a good work in you is the one who is faithful to complete it. Philippians 1, verse 6. Uh, and then he, God who, who justifies, he will surely glorify. Romans 8, 30. Not anything in all of creation is able to separate us from the love of God. Romans 8, 39. But he who endures to the end will be saved. Matthew 24, 13. Let us strive to enter that eternal rest. Hebrews 4, verse 11. So we're the ones doing the striving, but God's the one doing the upholding, okay? They, the, the two things work in complement with each other. They're not contradictory. But for your part, your responsibility is to strive, to fight, to run with endurance and self-discipline. Keep the faith. But we do that by grace, through faith. And now Paul sitting here in prison, can say to Timothy, I made it. I endured to the end. I kept the faith. 
Even with all the hardships and the sufferings that I went through, all those, those different fancy sounding arguments that tried to defeat my Christianity by the grace of God, none of that defeated my faith. Here I am, the end of my life, still clinging to Jesus. So how did he do it? How did he keep going? What was it that so motivated Paul that no matter how hard it got, he could stay faithful? Following Jesus all the way to the end of his life. Well, first, a story. Florence Chadwick was a world-class swimmer. In 1951, she became the first woman ever to swim across the English Channel, uh, going in both directions. And she even set a new world record going against the current in the direction from England to France. Looking for the next challenge, in 1952, she set out to swim across the Catalina Channel, an approximately 32-kilometer stretch of ocean between Catalina Island and the coast of California. She was accompanied by a crew of boats to make sure that she wouldn't be hit by any other ships, uh, and then they also had rifles to ward away any sharks. Uh, good plan. After about 15 hours of swimming, a thick, heavy fog rolled in across the bay so that she couldn't see anything. The water temperature dropped. The humidity made it hard for her to breathe. Her mother was actually in one of those boats riding along with her to encourage her. But finally, in desperation, she called on the safety crew to pull her into the boat. When the fog lifted, she learned that she had stopped only 800 meters from the shore. Later in an interview, she said, look, I'm not excusing myself, but if I could have seen the land, I know I could have made it. It's amazing the kind of hope and motivation that it can be to be able to see your goal. What motivates the boxer to, to keep getting up after getting knocked down, round after round, to keep fighting? What is it that, that motivates the marathon runner to keep running kilometer after kilometer? What motivated Paul to keep following Jesus no matter how hard it got? Because they're looking forward to their reward. <laughs> and for Paul, it's not just some big shiny championship belt or a gold medal. Look what he says in, in verse 8. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Paul keeps his eyes fixed on that eternal reward. And I love this. Paul emphasizes that this crown is awarded by the righteous judge. Don't just throw away that phrase there. Uh, I mean, if we're looking at, at Paul's life from the standards of the world, then we'd probably judge Paul's life as a failure, right? I mean, think about the beginning. You know, he had a, he had a really good thing going for him as a Pharisee. Right? He could have got married, got a nice little house in, in suburbia, Jerusalem, raised the kids, maybe even had a little lakefront home, vacation home on the Sea of Galilee. I'd right? be a popular teacher in the synagogue, never in want or in need. That would have looked like a pretty successful life, right? But he threw it all away. Spent the rest of his life in and out of prisons all over the Mediterranean. His body must have been so scarred up from how many times he'd been beaten and stoned. Plus all these churches he's planting, man, they're just a mess at following Jesus. So all that anxiety is keeping him up at nights. And now here we find him, an old man sitting alone in another prison cell. Most of his friends had deserted him. He's about to be executed as a criminal. I mean, let's be honest. Nobody's going to look at that and say, that's a successful life. But Jesus, the righteous judge, isn't judging by the world's standards. You see, success for a Christian looks totally different than it does for the world. By Jesus' standard, I mean, what, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world, forfeit his soul? Right? Whoever wants to be first among you must be the least, the servant. Whoever wants to be uh, the greatest must be the servant of all. 
You see, Paul's not performing to be judged by the standards of the world. He doesn't care about that perishable prize. He's living for the righteous judge, trying to please Jesus. He wants nothing more than to cross into everlasting life and hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. And that reward, it's not just for Paul. He says, uh, just because he's like some super apostle or something, maybe he gets some special heavenly reward. No, he says, it's not to me only, but also to everyone who loves and longs for that day when Jesus will return. Is that you? Do you love the idea of that day when Jesus will come back again? When we'll get to see Jesus face to face for the first time? Right? You can't wait for that day, for that, that kingdom, because that's what you've been living your whole life for, storing up treasures there. And so that's where your heart is also. Is that you? This is so motivating. Don't you feel that doesn't this want to make you like run through a brick wall for Jesus? You know, I, I hear Paul saying these things. He's like, I fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. I'm like, yeah, go, Paul. You did it. You made it. And when I get there, I want to say, be able to say the same thing, too. I don't want to be on that list of people that this didn't make it. I don't want to be one of those people that falls short. I want, to, I want to run like I'm trying to win the prize. I want to stand firm in my faith all the way to the end. I want to get to the end, cross that finish line, and hear Jesus say, well done. Some of you are looking ahead to that finish line, and it feels a lot closer than others. You got a lot more track behind you than you do in front of you. Maybe you're thinking, man, did I really fight? How, how well did I really run? Maybe you've been knocked down. Maybe you feel like you've been knocked down a lot more than standing up and fighting. But don't forget. Don't forget where Paul started. Right? He was one of those people who was persecuting the Christians. It's never too late to change your direction. To start pointing your life to Jesus. Right? There's no time like the present. But for those who have been running, maybe you're weary, discouraged. I want to tell you, keep your eyes on the prize. It's not just a good t-shirt slogan. It's true. Right? Fixing our eyes on Jesus. Don't look back and judge your life and your legacy by the standards of the world. Jesus is the righteous judge. You can trust him to judge rightly, to reward appropriately. Nothing has gone unnoticed by him. So keep going. Press on. Stand firm to the end. Stay steadfast. You're doing well. Keep going. And also let me tell you this. We need you. We need your example of steadfast, faithful believer who's following Jesus firm to the end. We need to see, the younger generations need to see that it's possible. And you show us that it's possible. You inspire us with your faith. As we take up the baton and run the next leg of the race, we are your legacy. So stand firm. Stay fast. Stay steadfast. And then for those fresh new runners out there, you still have most of the race ahead of you. Don't forget what you're running for. Don't forget the real prize. Don't get distracted by all the false worldly pleasures, those things that are trying to weigh you down, trying to tempt you to run off the track. Don't be deceived by the philosophies of the world that make you doubt your faith. Don't be, uh, don't be caught up by, by all, the, all the struggles. Be warned, it's, it's going to be hard. It's going to be tough. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But don't give up. Don't give up. It's worth it. The cause is worth the cost. The prize is worth the pain. For I consider 
that the sufferings of this present time are not even worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Romans 8, 18. Look ahead, look to the example of those who have gone before you. Jesus, for, first and foremost of all, you've got this. Stay steadfast with all his energy that he's so powerfully working within you. Two months after her failed attempt, Florence Chadwick tried that same swim again across the Catalina Channel. And once again, a heavy fog rolled in so that she couldn't see the shore. But this time, she kept in her mind a mental picture of the California coastline. And this time she made it, even setting the new record by two hours. Keep the goal in mind. Fight the good fight. Finish the race. Keep the faith. Let me pray for us. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Paul and his example, for Jesus and his example, for the examples of so many faithful believers who have gone before us, who have clung to you and, and just proven that, that you are better. Life with you is better than anything this world has to offer. I pray that you would help us uh, cling to that truth, to keep clinging to Jesus amidst all the temptations to uh, go other directions. Father, help us to, to stay true by your grace, to stay true to Jesus. Let's to stand firm all the way to the end and to finish well. 